This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. It's always been odd to me how some traditions we have seem to have been around forever, but when you start looking into it, they came around in the last century or so. For instance, Santa Claus being a jolly red, white-bearded man only came about in 1931 as an advertising campaign from Coca-Cola. The idea of a US president pardoning turkeys only became an annual tradition with Bush Sr. in 1989. But most interesting to me was the tradition of consumer diamonds. The concept of spending two months' salary on an engagement ring, an anniversary diamond on the second year, or even the concept of engagement rings themselves stem from the marketing campaigns launched in the 1930s. And all of these campaigns, all of this marketing, came from one company, De Beers. De Beers was a company started in Kimberley, in South Africa, where the De Beers family bought a large deposit of diamonds, also known as pipelines, and sold those diamonds to the European and American markets. De Beers became such a staple in the industry that they were big enough to simply buy out their competitors or bankrupt them at their decision. So the majority of the world's diamond trade sat with the De Beers company, and they were very clever in how to grow their market. In 1910, only 5% of rings had diamonds in them in the United States. But after the you must spend two months of your salary on an engagement ring campaign, diamonds are now a staple mineral to place in the ring before you pop the question. But diamonds have more use than just asking a partner to marry you. They're used in machinery and many industrial processes. But there's another use that's much less talked about. A much shadier use for these beautiful rocks. And these uses would include money laundering, arms sales, conflict support, bribes, and liquid assets. For many decades now, diamonds from countries like Sierra Leone, Angola, or Zimbabwe were being pulled out of the ground by rebel groups and sold to arms dealers and merchants in exchange for everything from support from South African mercenaries to Soviet tanks and helicopters to fight the war. It was a currency that was small, easy to move, and almost untraceable. Perfect when you need to move illegal items across borders. These diamonds came to be known as blood diamonds, or conflict diamonds to use the correct terms, and they were a huge resource for the black market. In the late 90s, though, a number of damning reports were released, focusing on how the diamonds around the neck of wealthy women in New York were directly funding wars and famines in places like Sierra Leone. And the world decided to finally do something about it. So in 1999, we got the Kimberley Accords. A system where every diamond would be tracked and traced all the way from the ground to the retail store. And that no country in the middle of a civil war could sell diamonds to fund the fighting. Under the Kimberley Accords, each diamond would have to be marked and sealed at its country of origin, and would have to have a chain of custody all the way to the retailer. And there was great cheers and pats on the back from the industry. They solved the problem. Conflict diamonds were no longer a thing. That's the thing about people. When money's on the line, people find a way. When we started digging into this story, we came across something odd. We had plenty of people willing to come forward and chat with us about it, and take us all the way through the inner workings of the diamond trade. But as soon as we asked if they would like to go public or come on the show, they were very quick to apologize, stating that their careers may be on the line if they were to come forward after bashing certain companies. And even if they were to work for a competitor now, they can never be certain that one of the big companies wouldn't buy out theirs and then cause them trouble in the future. This is something the show did not come across when we're digging into similar pieces like the rare earth trade and just demonstrated to us the influence that some of these larger companies in the diamond trade actually have. And as much as we look at the Kimberley Accords as the be-all and end-all to the problem, the diamond necklace you may have around your neck might have a far darker history behind it. But how are these smugglers getting around the system? Who is engaging in the arms for diamonds trade? And can conflict diamonds ever really be stopped? Well, to answer all those questions, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Coveted Carbon Really, the modern diamond trade started in Africa in the late 1800s. Diamonds obviously had existed and been found in other parts of the world, in Brazil and India, 
Um, but it was really the discovery of the pi Kimberlite pipes in Kimberley, South Africa, that led to a real diamond rush across the country uh, that starts, um, you know, the founding of the, the De Beers company and really launches, um, you know, the career of Cecil Rhodes, but also the modern industry as we know it in, across Southern Africa, even though the core of the trade in terms of, you know, manufacturing and retail happens outside of Africa, uh, as is true with so many natural resources, the story of, of most uh, of the products over the last century begin in Africa. Currently, the leading diamond producer is in Russia and Canada and Australia have also been important producers over time. But you really can't talk for very long about the diamond trade without starting uh, without rooting yourself in Africa. Brad Brooks Rubin is the global director of development for the Gemological Institute of America, advising on issues surrounding gems and the jewelry sectors. He was also a special advisor to the U.S. State Department on issues surrounding conflict minerals. Brad is a fantastic expert to take us through the complicated world of conflict minerals. He joins us today. A part of it, it just stems from the history of the trade, the um, the core of the trade originally being really in South Africa, um, the importance of Botswana in recent years. And, you know, in the last decade, De Beers has shifted its almost the entirety of its operations to headquarters in Botswana. Um, there are parts of the continent where, you know, the quality and the per carat value of diamonds may be higher than you find in other parts of the world. Um, but, you know, the, the, the trade has diversified. It has varied. Uh, as you mentioned, Russia, Canada, for a long time, Australia was really the the true kind of leading producer and, and Australia helped to create, you know, what what is now the Indian diamond industry in many ways. Um, so I think the connections to Africa are partly historic. Uh, there are certain parts of the continent that are producing higher value or, or distinct distinct types of diamonds. Um, uh, and still, you know, a, there are a large number of industrial mines that are found across southern Africa uh, and, you know, even offshore, uh, off the shore of Namibia, where there's some uh, seabed mining. To begin this conversation, I want to talk about the difference between certain diamonds here. With diamonds being just compressed carbon, is there a chemical difference to determine between, let's say, a diamond from Angola as opposed to maybe a diamond from South Africa? Um, to a decent extent, you can. There are there are chemical differences, as you say. Diamonds are, you know, they are in their pure form carbon, um, but diamonds always include other, uh, or almost always include other types of impurities, N nitrogen. Uh, is an important one. There are technically four types of diamonds based on their chemical makeup, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, and, and the presence of nitrogen determines which of those there are. Mo almost all diamonds are 1A, which uh, just gets to the percentage of nitrogen. Uh, but you can have other, uh, other elements as well, boron, phosphorus, hydrogen, uh, and those other chemicals and other impurities that just found their way into the crystal as the diamond was forming um, are um, often what gives the diamond, um, you know, its color. And you can tell, you know, it's not necessarily country based, obviously, but, you know, as diamonds were coming to the surface through pipes, there tend to be, um, there are tendencies in what diamond, what kinds of inclusions they're called in the trade or impurities exist in a diamond and you can start to say, well, you know, this mine in this part of South Africa tends to have diamonds that have, you know, a higher percentage of these elements or this color. Well, to stay on Africa for a bit, which African nations are the bigger players in the diamond export trade? Sure. Um, so by volume and value, Botswana is the leading producer. And it is important always when people talk about, you know, which countries are, are, are the main producers to, to determine whether you're talking about volume or value. But in this case, it's both. And, and these are, you know, what exists in Botswana are still a number of very large industrial mines, principally De Beers, but other companies as well. Uh, um, Angola is an important player. Um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is actually a leading producer by volume um, in Africa, actually second to Botswana. Uh, but the value ends up being quite low. Um, Namibia is an important producer. South Africa, you know, as a percentage and as a as a sort of player in the trade, has really seen its 
uh, a lot of its mines have, you know, have, have run dry and it is a much less producer than it used to be. Um, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, I mean, Tanzania has one sort of important industrial mine. Sierra Leone has an industrial mining, but it is also has a lot of artisanal or alluvial mining. Um, Liberia, Guinea, um, and the Central African Republic are all, um, you know, relevant producers uh, to the trade. So diamonds, for the most part, are just carbon, one of the most abundant elements on the entire planet. So why is it that in many cases, they're more expensive than elements like neodymium, which are quite rare? And at this point, it might be good to bring up the company De Beers, a company that has for decades now had a huge stranglehold on the diamond industry. Can you explain how De Beers works and why diamonds are so expensive, considering that they're just carbon for the most part? So today... De Beers produces around, I believe it's in the 35 to 40 percent range, uh, give or take, of the world's diamonds. Um, but the, you know, compared to in in previous you know generations, you know, upwards of 80 uh, or more percent uh, of the world's diamonds, because um, they were involved in buying diamonds produced by others, whereas now they are principally just producing and selling diamonds that they are mining themselves in, in the few mines, the, the, the smaller number of mines that they own. Um, but De Beers created, um, uh, and it's, you know, at the time it's rivals in, in South Africa, but the industry really developed around the model that De Beers um, created, which, which does create that level of, of rarity and scarcity. But historically, diamonds are not sold on an open market. This is not a you know, a metal exchange or a commodity exchange where people are buying and selling gold or other metals um, through that kind of tender and, 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 and sale process. Uh, De Beers created what is known as the site holder system, uh, which is in, in essence creating, uh, selecting its customers and then providing those customers with uh, diamonds sufficient to meet that customer's needs basically within the trade. Uh, and so... Uh, and other large mining companies really mirrored, mimic that system uh, of site holders. Um, and, you know, they were able to then create a real gateway in terms of how much uh, production would be released into the market. You know, then from there, you know, a site holder would then often resell and, and, and go from there. And, and um, the, the, the core model of the site system still largely exists and and De Beers although its percentage of diamonds is lesser you know the prices it's setting the num the, the volume it's releasing in its sites really still do hold sway on the market um, you know the diamond industry press will report on what happened at the De Beers site which now takes place in Botswana um, and look to that how much is De Beers releasing what prices is it, are, is it setting um, as a real trend about where the industry is going. And, and, and the price point is also the other one, which is De Beers traditionally had a sort of take it or leave it. This is the price, right? There wasn't a negotiation. There wasn't a, there's not a commodity price. So it's sort of De Beers saying, this is your box and this is what it's going to cost. Um, and if you don't want it, you may not be a site holder in the future. You know, to a large extent, the De Beer, what De Beers is doing with its sites um, really does still set the trend in the industry, even if it is not the, you know, by volume, the one that is dictating things in the way that it did, say, you know, 75 years ago. With the De Beers company being the choke point between the diamond mines and the diamond markets, do you think they have the ability to withhold large amounts of diamonds and create some scarcity in the market, artificially inflating the price of diamonds? You know, do they have that ability at the moment? I've certainly heard rumors about them and about, you know, Alrosa and Russia and, and a range of other um, producers over time. And what I will say is that it is it is really true that, you know, whether it's not whether it's De Beers or others, I mean, the real the trade is often dominated by and really the main profits to be made uh, seem to largely come at the mining side and the retail side. This, though, is focusing largely on the legal diamond trade. But I want to focus a bit on the illegal diamond trade, probably better known to most people as conflict or blood diamonds. What is the difference between, let's say, a conflict diamond that comes from the Central African Republic and a legal diamond that comes from somewhere like Russia? A conflict diamond 
is a is a technical term. It's a by definition, it is the core of what was created in something called the Kimberley process. Um, you know, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, reports emerged about how armed groups in Angola and Sierra Leone and Liberia and parts of the Democratic Republic of the Congo were mining diamonds or, or rather taking over parts of their territory and, and forcing uh, local communities to mine diamonds, then taking those diamonds and exchanging them or selling them for weapons uh, to pursue their uh, efforts to overthrow governments. Um, and so that's how a conflict diamond is is defined. The international community came together and said, this is a problem. Uh, we need to address it. Uh, you know, and the industry was, was alongside it. Um, and so they defined conflict diamond based on what the problem was at the time. So a, t a conflict diamond is a rough diamond that is sold by a militia group or its allies for the purpose of overthrowing a legitimate government. Um, that was what was agreed to in the Kimberley process and memorialized in a UN General Assembly resolution and then uh, in the national legislation uh, implementing the Kimberley process, you know, in, in uh, dozens of countries around the world. Diamonds are a fantastic currency for buying illegal arms. They're small, they're untraceable, and in many cases, they're very easy to smuggle across the borders. Can you take us through how the average diamond trade actually is facilitated? How do you trade diamonds for helicopters? Yeah. So, I mean, at the time, um, you know, it was happening really with pretty open uh, connection to actors in, in the legitimate trade, right? So in the 90s, um, you know, there is, you know, there are reports, you know, I mean, Global Witness did the, the, organ the NGO Global Witness uh, did the real first report on this called a rough trade that exposed what was happening uh, with UNITA and Angola and demonstrated that there was awareness at De Beers and other big companies to what was going on and the willingness to, you know, essentially have these diamonds uh, come into the legitimate trade, uh, selling them, you know, armed groups, selling them to actors who were, um, you know, essentially representatives or proxies of big companies, and then those diamonds going into the trade. And then, you know, once, because there is no, um, uh, you know, there's not, not, there's no identifier on a diamond, you don't know where it comes from. And because diamonds, although there is some, you know, chemical distinction from one place to another, uh, you know, you can have analogous, di you know, a diamond produced in Angola can be very similar to one, say, produced in another part of the world. Um, those diamonds, would get into the trade and, and go from there. And then you need to have its own mechanisms to buy guns. There were times in which, um, you know, armed groups would buy directly from um, from arms dealers or would provide diamonds directly to arms dealers, Victor Boot, for example. Um, and then those guys had their own connections with, you know, unsavory actors in the diamond trade who are willing to figure out how to get those diamonds essentially laundered into the, the regular trade. Um, so it's, it, you know, in the, in the nineties, when, when UNITA was, was added, it, it wasn't really that hard, um, to be honest, uh, sadly, um, that has changed. I mean, the Kimberley process hasn't stopped the problem of conflict diamonds. You mentioned the Central African Republic. Cote d'Ivoire was another example in the late 2000s where we saw, you know, officially defined conflict diamonds. Um, so they tend to come out from places like, you know, Northern Cote d'Ivoire, Central African Republic with, you know, really no border controls um, and the ability of armed groups to work with smugglers who will take the diamonds out and, you know, move them to, you know, likely to different trading centers, whether Dubai or, or you know, Dubai is the likeliest destination. Um, and then ultimately, almost all diamond roads lead to India for cutting. Uh, so it's possible some of these diamonds go directly to India, uh, which cuts something on the order of 90, 93% of the world's diamonds. Um, and, you know, they're able to work more directly with actors who, again, are willing to um, uh, to engage in illicit activities. Um, you know, the Kimberley process only applies to rough diamonds. So once a diamond is cut and polished, 
the KP no longer applies, and they're really once a diamond is cut and polished, unless it's inscribed, uh, you know, with a laser um, inside to sort of say where it comes from, there really is no way to track that, um, or the use or blockchain technology is used to to sort of memorialize where the diamond comes from. Um, so once, as long as you have a route that can get a diamond to a, a cutter, then you're okay. So as an example here, if someone was to, let's say, dig up some diamonds in a conflict zone like Sierra Leone and then put it in their pockets and walk across the border into Liberia, then they tell the Kimberley Accords they found the diamonds in Liberia. Does that completely bypass the entire Kimberley Accords safety and accountability process? Is it this obvious loophole in the process? Um, it is very easy, uh, unfortunately. Um, and there are a range of reasons for that. Um Partly it is, you know, again, the, um, the capacity um, of, um, you know, monitoring the border between Liberia and Sierra Leone is limited uh, or any of the countries in, in that part of West Africa. Um, you know, it's frankly not to just pick on Africa. It's not that, you know, it's pretty easy to, um, you know, have a rough diamond come in and go out again, probably of JFK airport um, without much detection either. Um, you know, there is diamonds are by their nature hard to track. Um, diamonds are um, easy to manipulate in terms of, you know, most, say, customs officials or border guards aren't really going to know anything about the technical side of diamonds. So even if you have even if they figure out that something's a diamond um, for them to understand where it really came from, what it's valued at, again, they often have little to no ability to do that. So, um, you know, in your example, it happens all the time that people will move diamonds from one country to another. Sometimes they're just trying to avoid tax or avoid fees. Um, in West Africa and in Central Africa, there have been efforts over the years to ensure that there is tax and fee harmonization. Um, but sometimes that hasn't happened. And so diamonds will, you know, producers will have them move from one place to another. Um, and and, um, you know, so whether that's for, you know, it's for tax evasion, for fee avoidance, um, and it's very easy, sadly, to um, t to have diamonds that, you know, move from uh, one producing country to a trading center and then get mixed into the process. So there isn't um, the Kimberley process is entirely paper based and every certificate, every country issues its, its own unique certificates and there isn't connectivity. There is supposed to be an exchange of information back and forth so that there is harmonization of statistics and reported trades. But the fact is there isn't, you know, a universal database where you could look and see, okay, these diamonds left Sierra Leone, they went to Dubai, and then they went to India, and then they got manufactured. That doesn't exist. And the Kimberley process allows um, for what are called mixed origin certificates. So a diamond's, you know, a shipment of diamonds can go from South Africa to Dubai. Um, someone can bring in an illicit stone from the Central African Republic, package it together with those diamonds from South Africa, send and now send a parcel out of Dubai to India with a certificate from Dubai that says mixed. Um, and there you do not need to have that level of traceability to say, OK, here is your parcel leaving Dubai. Where did all these diamonds come from? Um, there is supposed to be that level of uh, connectivity and, and, and traceability, but it just doesn't exist in practice. And that gets to the fact that the Kimberley process was established without a secretariat, without a core staff. Each year there is a chair, and that year's chair is really responsible for keeping the organization going. And then there are a series of working groups that sort of monitor compliance and statistics. Um, but those working groups are made up of, you know, essentially working level representative diplomats or, or technocrats in different ministries uh, in member governments um, who have other jobs and often don't have the time or the ability to do um, what they need to do to keep the monitoring and oversight going. So the Kimberley process has a very rigorous system in theory of peer review and of statistical monitoring. In reality, you know, countries go years upon years without getting a review visit. 
Uh, when those review visits happen, very little happens uh, in terms of follow-up. Statistical analysis is not uh, followed up on in the way it, it should be. So the and there isn't a full-time staff at the KP keeping track of all of these things to push members to get their work done, which happens in other initiatives. So, you know, it's often very easy for someone to look and say, look, a diamond goes from Sierra Leone to Liberia because it's, you know, those countries do a bad job of monitoring their borders. On one land, that's true. But this, this entire system was set up to be able to overcome that problem. And the fact is it doesn't work because the investment hasn't been made in the staffing and the professionalization and the statistical um, and technical needs that a multi-million, you know, this is a, a system monitoring hundreds of millions of carats a year in trading, um, you know, really with very mid 20th century technology. And as a result, there's no way they're really going to be able to track how that diamond moves from Sierra Leone to Liberia, um, whether where it got a certificate, if it got one at all, et cetera. Um, and so it's, um, it's a real challenge for the Kimberly process. And I, uh, I'll conclude this by just saying I have, for the last couple of years, advocated that it's time to get rid of the Kimberly process because a lot of people are spending a lot of time and a lot of money for a system that does not have the ability to, to, to stop that very core, very basic problem that you described of a diamond, you know, being walked from one country to another uh, and getting into the system without the right paperwork. When I spoke to friends and family at the early stages of this piece, I asked them what their opinions on diamond mining were and how they felt about conflict diamonds. And the majority of them all gave me relatively the same answer. Do they think conflict diamonds are a horrible practice? but they got their engagement ring from a reputable seller who promised them that they were ethical diamonds, free from war or child labor. And that is the story being sold in the world of diamonds, that the Kimberley Accords have made the diamond trade ethical and conflict-free. But as we dive further in, there may be a lot more blood and misery underneath that conflict-free label. And to talk more about that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2 undermining sanctions. You know, it, it's always, you know, it's mixed, I would say. Um, you know, diamonds have brought a lot of benefits to Africa, you know, and, you know, in some places they've created a lot of problems. Um, you know, when countries with uh, good governance like Botswana sort of took control of their own destiny and their own resources uh, to manage effectively, uh, diamonds have done a lot of good. Um, you know, and, and Botswana became independent in, uh, I think it was 1969, and diamonds were discovered there maybe three years later. And, you know, uh, the country's basically had a straight up trajectory of, of growth and prosperity you know uh so you know that that's a good story for diamonds you know we all know sierra leone and uh well essentially the west african story uh that that had a lot of uh where the the tailor is much less uh beneficial russell shaw is a well-respected author and expert on the minerals industry he's a spokesman for the gia and so reported for the New York Times and the Financial Times in London, as well as many other publications. He's also written a number of key white papers on the industry, and we're very happy to have him join us today. Corrupt politicians, revolutionary governments, revolution groups uh, went after the diamonds to, to fund their revolutions. So that, that was Angola um, and Sierra Leone. We, we know those stories. Uh, Zimbabwe hasn't been a good story. Uh, more currently, Zimbabwe hasn't been a good story um, because, you know, they discovered a very large deposit there uh, called Merengue. And, uh, you know, the former dictator Mugabe wanted to develop it. Uh, essentially, uh, they, they had to, uh, they, they violently belled the uh, artisanal miners, you know, and there have been continuing human rights abuses, uh, rights abuses in, in Zimbabwe over the diamond deposits. So, as I said, it, it's mixed. 
Um, it kind of depends on uh, a mix of the the local government and uh, outside mining companies on on how how they get to to work together. So if diamonds are really just pressurized carbon for the most part, why are they so expensive? What makes them more valuable in the market than a lot of other commodities out there that have far more use? Is it just the rarity of diamonds on the market that keeps the price as high as it is? I guess the best way to define rarity is um, it's much scarcer. Diamonds are much scarcer than the demand for them. And also, when you are digging for diamonds, you essentially have to fill up half a room with uh, uh, dirt and gravel to get one carat of diamond. So in that sense, I mean, you, you can go to a diamond mine and you could take a pick and a shovel and you could dig for days and never see a diamond. So, you know, that they're kind of rare even in a diamond mine. So, um, you know, and it takes very sophisticated equipment to extract and find the diamonds in the ore. And the process is actually quite costly. So which nations at the moment are the big exporters of diamonds? Who are the big, let's say, three to five players in the diamond industry right now? Well, currently, the the big three are uh, uh, Russia, Botswana, Canada, and then uh, you can add uh, South Africa uh, to make it the big four. Uh, five, Angola is pretty large. And from what I understand, Angola's diamonds are quite sought after. Uh, people will regularly pay extra for Angolan diamonds as opposed to, let's say, Russian ones. Why is that? Angola is a source for a lot of alluvial stones in, in what they call the Lundas. Uh, Lunda Norte, Lunda Sud. And um, which kind of, it, it pretty close to the border of, Cong of, of uh, the Congo. Uh, and some of the Congo goods are, come from that same area, but they've been mined a lot longer. So, but those are where those are where the quality stones come from. But then there's a working kimberlite mine that, that actually produces a lot of goods uh, called Katoka, and Katoka is run by a Russian company called Alrosa, and those goods are more in the sort of more commercial range. With the Russian company Alrosa being one of the major players in the diamond industry, operating in countries such as Angola, India, and Russia, much of the first connections that Alrosa made in Angola were during the Civil War, where they were trading conflict diamonds for guns and supplies to the Russian government, at that point the Soviet government, as well as Cuba. Although that business structure has had to change, as in 1999, conflict diamonds were given an official designation in an effort to curb the black market trade. What did this official definition of conflict diamonds actually do to the industry? Before the conflict diamond issue arose, De Beers controlled about three quarters of the world rough supply, either by its own mines or sales contracts with other producers like, again, Russia and um, Australia's Argyle. And the reason for that is they wanted to manage the supply so you didn't have a boom and bust cycle in diamonds. De Beers was sitting on, you know, mountains of diamonds and only letting a few out. But uh, they were really trying to manage the business cycle of boom and bust. De Beers controlled most of the stones up to that point. But they all, and one way they did that was they had buying offices in places where they didn't have mines. So when artisanal diggers bring their finds into uh, whatever town there were close, De Beers would have an office. And what De Beers would do was essentially set a floor price for diamonds. So anyone else who wanted to buy the stones had to essentially outbid De Beers. And that system was in place since the 1930s conflict diamond issue changed all of that because nobody knew where these diamonds were coming from. And, um, you know, you know, De Beers it was pretty good with its uh, market intelligence and they kind of knew a 
a firestorm was coming over publicity. So they just pulled out very quickly. Uh, they pulled out of Angola, Sierra Leone. They uh, walked away from that uh, one deposit in Zimbabwe because it, uh, they knew they couldn't secure it. Uh, so they um, essentially stopped buying independent goods. Those kind of stones were always a fairly small minority in the market to begin with. I mean, 90 percent or 85 to 90 percent are uh, of diamonds are produced in large scale mines. So, um, you know, and, and the smuggled goods you're talking about are basically alluvial goods. And uh, they've always been a relatively small part of the market. And, um, you know, and, you know, typically alluvial goods of, you know, whether it's colored gems or anything, you know, it, were hard to control because they're small and easily concealed. Another major shakeup for the industry is lab-made diamonds or synthetic diamonds, uh, which are now taking a bigger part of the diamond industry. Do you think people will start to replace their need for diamonds from some of these very hard to trace African nations with synthetic diamonds, which are almost chemically exactly the same, but instead made in a lab and usually a first world country? Uh, it's very possible. The way the market is kind of shaping up, um, you know, there's still a relatively new product, uh, but the way the market is kind of shaping up is that the cost structure uh, operating a full-scale diamond mine, um, you know, depends on having a robust market for these smaller, lower quality goods because, uh, you know, in uh, Botswana, let's say, you know, the large mines, Arapa, Zhuaneng, you know, they produce a lot of smaller, lower quality goods. And, and you know, even though they're not the, the most valuable, they're still a fairly significant part of the, the revenue for the, for the companies. So the cost of diamond mining is always going up, but since synthetic diamonds, or they prefer lab-grown, uh, lab-grown diamonds is a new technology like computers or whatever, the cost is always going down. Um, so you keep getting more for less. So you have these two streams running opposite one another. So it, at some point, you know, the, the lab grown diamonds will offer a better product than a small, lower quality natural. And, you know, uh, in many cases, consumers may opt for that. So it'll put these large mining operations under pressure. That's what I see coming. Um, that's my own opinion. Lab-made diamonds may be the future for many areas of the diamond market with lab diamonds these days being even cheaper and in some cases more pure than regular natural diamonds that are mined legally in some of these African nations. But there is still always the illegal mines, the ones that operate on the fringes of these countries and use the diamonds as an untraceable currency in exchanges for guns and contracts, protections and supplies. Diamonds are still one of the easiest to smuggle and most useful universal currencies around, particularly for guys like arms dealers who can get rid of them. And to talk more about this illegal diamond trade, we turn to our final guest. Part 3. A Fatal Currency The, the Kimberley process has, uh, to, to an extent, worked uh, when it comes to uh, ensuring that uh, most uh, diamonds produced uh, from those countries that are into, uh, into diamond mining are channeled towards the formal systems. Uh, however, what uh, the Kimberley process has failed to do largely is to take all new forms of, uh, of conflict. The Kimberley process has failed to understand and appreciate that uh, the nature of conflicts uh, in the conflict uh, sector have changed. So what do I mean? The Kimberley process uh, over the years has resisted uh, changing the definition 
from purely focusing on uh, conflict associated with uh, the activities of rebel movements uh, that seek to unseat uh, legitimate governments. And uh, they are still sticking to that kind of definition, which has fallen out of uh, scope with uh, what's happening on the ground nowadays, where you have uh, not just uh, rebel movements, but uh, we have uh, state actors, state security, we have private security, and we also have companies themselves committing human rights violations and causing conflicts. And these kind of conflicts include uh, the type of uh, local villages and uh, communities, environmental degradation, uh, pollution of rivers, displacement of local communities, and other violations that are being perpetrated by state actors. Uh, for example, you have a situation where some actors are like soldiers, like the police or private sector can be uh, um, beating up people, killing people in the diamond mining sector. And uh, the Kimberley process has turned a blind eye to those kind of uh, atrocities. And I think this is the, the, the kind of thing that uh, as civil society, we've been pushing the Kimberley process to recognize and change the definition of what constitutes uh, conflict diamonds from purely focusing on rebel movements or the activities of uh, rebel movements to now focus on state actors as well, as well as non-state actors like the companies themselves. If you look at companies, companies are also committing human rights violations, for example, like poor working conditions at the mine site and uh, also uh, pollution of uh, the rivers and displacement of local communities. And this is being perpetrated by uh, diamond mining companies, for example, those uh, operating in Africa. So I think those are, those are things that on which uh, the Kimberley process over the years have been, has been uh, grappling with, but not able to um, uh, effect change uh, in terms of uh, the definition. So they have tended to turn a blind, blind eye on those uh, atrocities and human rights violations that are happening. Shamiza Mutizi is an environmental lawyer and the Kimberley Process Civil Society Coordinator. He's also the Deputy Director for the Zimbabwe and International Law Association and a fantastic journalist focusing on the Africa minerals market. We are very happy to have him join us today. The issue of expanding the definition has been very divisive within the Kimberley process. There are some countries uh, that are not keen on, uh, on, on reforming because they are benefiting from um, situations where there is violence and from situations where the state and uh, non-state actors are committing human rights uh, violations because they are getting diamonds on the cheap. So that in itself is a, is a major problem uh, in terms of uh, how the Kimberley process has failed uh, to move um, beyond focusing on rebel movements. And then the other thing that uh, I wanted to uh, draw to your attention is that uh, the Kimberley process uh, is still facing a huge challenge when it comes to um, uh, conflict diamonds, because in Central African Republic, there's a war going on there. There are rebel movements that are, that are, um, are killing people. There are rebel movements that are displacing people. And uh, the situation in Central African Republic is of concern. Of course, the Kimberley process has tried to do something, but uh, I think the, the, the thing is, uh, there are countries around the Central African Republic that have not uh, invested uh, enough time and, and resources into resolving the conflict in Central African Republic. There's a, a conflict uh, that is taking place, which involves uh, rebel movements uh, that are trying to unseat uh, a government. So those rebels are using diamonds uh, to try and control certain populations, certain areas, or even controlling uh, diamond mining weapon, uh, diamond mining uh, areas. So most of the money that's made on these diamond mines, where is it ending up? Who's actually benefiting from the diamond mining in Africa? Uh, most of the diamond mining companies and most of the countries where diamonds are mined uh, not promoting uh, proper use of revenues and also transparency and accountability when it comes to ensuring that uh, Diamond revenues uh, benefit the people. The Kimberley process is not concerned about how countries uh, uh, use uh, the revenue from, from diamonds. So this has been uh, a problem. And uh, I can even cite uh, the example of, uh, of, of Zimbabwe, where, where, where I'm best. And uh, 
where we have uh, a situation where diamonds have not uh, uh, resulted in any community development, development of infrastructure, um, investment into schools, investment into hospitals and other social services. So diamonds have, uh, to that extent, have, uh, have, 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 have failed to, uh, to glow and uh, to, to sparkle for, for the local communities. So on that front, again, uh, the Kimberley process has, uh, has, has largely failed. So if I'm understanding this correctly, the Kimberley process can be thwarted by simply moving diamonds from one country to another country. You can mine some diamonds in the war zone that is the Central African Republic, then jump across the border to Cameroon and see you found them in Cameroon. Is something as simple as walking these things across the border really good enough to bypass the main safety catch on the diamond industry at the moment? So what normally happens is uh, because of the uh, poor uh, customs and border control systems, a lot of diamonds pass from one country to another by courier or by people who carry them to uh, the other side of, of the river so diamonds can pass from Central African Republic into Cameroon or other uh, countries around uh, there like Sudan. So those diamonds are, um, are normally uh, carried by, by, by people who move across, across uh, the borders. So it means that uh, there are very poor uh, border control systems uh, that can just be bypassed. And those diamonds are carried without any Kimberley process uh, certificate as required by the Kimberley process, and most of those diamonds are conflict diamonds. And they are coming from areas where there are rebel movements or where the mine sites are controlled by rebel movements. So that's a major problem in terms of control of, uh, of the borders by um, uh, neighboring countries. But what uh, we have uh, been discussing and uh, been uh, encouraging the Kimberley process is to make sure that those countries around Central Africa Republic, the neighboring countries, uh, also implement uh, systems and uh, processes to enhance their law enforcement and custom controls and collaborate or cooperate uh, so that they keep any illicit flow of, 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 of diamonds through, through the borders. If we keep our focus on the Central African Republic for a bit, the CIR's neighbours are themselves in quite a bit of conflict at the moment as well. I mean, Sudan is fighting rebels in Darfur, South Sudan is in the middle of a civil war, the DRC is one of the worst war zones on the planet, Cameroon is experiencing fighting between the English and French sectors, and Chad is at war with Boko Haram and ISIS in the north. Most of these nations are quite centrally weak. What do you think the chances of somewhere like Juba, the capital of South Sudan, actually being able to police the border for diamonds if their authority doesn't even extend that far on a normal day, let alone looking for diamond smugglers? I think uh, the idea is about uh, willingness and uh, the fact that uh, uh, South Sudan, for example, is not a member of the uh, Kimberley process. And I think it's important to start thinking about incorporating them and taking them into, into the Kimberley process and uh, uh, ensuring that they are able to um, adhere to certain standards that are required by the Kimberley process when it comes to cooperation and also when it comes to export of diamonds, uh, import and export of diamonds. So the, 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 the thing is, once a country becomes a member, it can also request for uh, what we call technical assistance uh, from other members of the Kimberley process. So there might be a country there that is, or a government that is willing to help um, keep illicit trade or across the borders, maybe through uh, use of modern technologies and the use of other, other, other systems, maybe through skills share or provision of equipment and uh, uh, also uh, supporting training of law enforcement uh, uh, officials uh, across the border. So th those are the kind of things that uh, some countries in the Kimberley process uh, can, can help. I know the European Union, for example, helped, has helped and has provided uh, technical assistance to, to, to different countries. Diamonds used to be the currency of choice for everyone from South African mercenaries to Russian arms dealers. You could use diamonds to pay for anything from bodyguards to helicopters. Did the reforms of 1999 solve this problem or is this illicit black market for diamonds trade still going on? In a conflict situation like Central Republic, and uh, in a situation where rebels are controlling some parts of Central Africa Republic, 
definitely that is happening. We have people on the ground and they have been telling us that uh, rebels are controlling certain parts of Central Africa Republic where diamond uh, mine sites are located. So uh, that is happening. And uh, I'm sure that's where uh, the rebels are getting their revenues to buy arms and also to feed themselves, uh, buy food and other uh, supplies which, uh, which, which they need. Uh, so that in a conflict situation uh, normally happens and uh, is also happening in uh, some parts of Central Africa Republic. And that is the reason why we have been raising concerns about the situation in Central Africa Republic because it's happening, which means uh, the rebel movement uh, are in control and uh, are using diamonds to fuel their uh, activities or to finance their activities. Then uh, I, I think uh, the, the other element is, uh, is gold. The use of uh, the proceeds of gold uh, in some parts of uh, Central Africa Republic. And uh, they, they're using it to buy arms, buy food and other supplies. So it's, 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 it's happening in Central Africa Republic. And who are the buyers here? Who is willing to trade you know, guns and weapons for diamonds? You know, the diamond trade is uh, replete with, uh, with crooks, uh, replete with uh, people who uh, opportunist and uh, these have been in operation for, for, for quite a long time. Uh, but of course, they, they replace each other from year to year or from uh, uh, generation to generation. I think there are people there who are daring uh, and uh, those, those people might be from uh, uh, different parts of Africa who buy diamonds and then resell them and uh, inject them into, into, in, into the system. So there, there are some reports, uh, uh, for example, that uh, there are some actors in Sudan who are buying the diamonds and then some of the actors, for example, were in the Central Africa Republic government and uh, they have been buying the, the diamonds and reselling them uh, illegally or illicitly outside the, the realm of the Kimberley process. So there are actors there who are actually buying and fueling uh, the, the trade. And uh, you know, you know what happens is, uh, in many cases, such diamonds then are injected through the system through fake certificates. And I think uh, if you look at uh, Sierra Leone, it has been one source of uh, fake certificates uh, that accompany uh, diamonds from uh, other 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 countries. And I think uh, this practice of cert fake certificates is uh, what. Uh, is uh, one of the key weaknesses of the Kimberley process because many countries, um, or some, in fact, some of the countries have very weak uh, uh, certificates. The security features are not very um, uh, timber proof or timber resistant. So as a result, they get uh, manipulated. And with online trading as well, uh, that uh, also uh, creates a lot of challenges in terms of how the Kimberley process position itself in a situation where diamonds are marketed and uh, traded on, uh, on, uh, on, online, uh, because you often see a lot of adverts online, someone saying I'm selling diamonds online and, and things like that. And uh, those diamonds are sold outside the Kimberley process. And then uh, we also have uh, an element related to money laundering. I think the Financial Action uh, Task Force came up with, uh, with a report in 2016, which pointed out some of the uh, vulnerabilities and risks associated with, uh, uh, with uh, the trade of diamonds, where uh, undervaluation is a problem. And then uh, also the issue of uh, money laundering because diamonds are easy to conceal and uh, um, can be used to finance uh, terrorists. So those, those are some of the vulnerabilities that but there is still a lot of money being made through this trade. So whose money is the pockets ending up in it? With uh, respect to the money that should have gone to uh, the pockets of uh, Zimbabweans, no, no, no one knows exactly who, who exactly is, uh, is benefiting from this uh, in terms of uh, how much money they got. But if you remember the, the former president of Zimbabwe, uh, the late uh, president uh, Mugabe, for example, at some point indicated that the country lost about 15 billion worth of money from uh, of revenue from um, the diamond mining sector because the companies 
were under declaring and were smuggling diamonds out of the country to other countries. So he mentioned that those country, companies that were operating in Marange, for example, Mbada Diamonds, Marange Resources, there was Sena Diamonds, about seven com companies that were operating there, uh, the ones that uh, uh, um, uh, took away diamonds worth 15 billion. And uh, it's not known who, who is behind uh, those companies, but I know that uh, a lot of groups uh, have uh, done some, some research in terms of ownership of some of the companies. But uh, where don't the street always point out to uh, 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 politicians having uh, benefited from some of the uh, revenue from, from the diamonds? And then some people outside Zimbabwe having uh, benefited from the diamonds, but but no one knows exactly who, who 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 benefited. The people are suffering. The people do not have access to healthcare, and they do not have access to electricity and uh, good roads, because uh, all the money was spirited away. So that's that's uh, a resource case that we have in the country. So with Zimbabwe being a landlocked country, how are they getting these illegal diamonds out to the resellers? How are they getting to Dubai for distribution or India for cutting and shaping? It's true that uh, some of the diamonds were moving from, from Zimbabwe across the border into, into Mozambique because that's where most of the traders or the legal buyers of diamonds were. The buyers were based in Mozambique. Uh, in an area called Chimoyo, which is just across the border. It's a town in, uh, in Mozambique. So uh, if you move up, uh, in that uh, uh, town, you, you are likely to uh, see a lot of uh, diamond traders. And at the peak, at the peak, most of them were camped in, uh, in, in, in that area just across uh, the border. And then some of the diamonds would go to South Africa via the Zimbabwe-South Africa border called Bad Bridge. So, the, yeah, there were lots of cases uh, of such a nature of uh, illicit uh, trade. Uh, but I would want to indicate that uh, at the moment, I think uh, cases of uh, illicit trade in terms of diamonds uh, have gone down, but they are still happening. It's still happening. What we have uh, had is a peak in terms of uh, illicit trade of gold, so you, you'll find that at the airport in, in Arare, lots of people are being caught with uh, gold bars. Some are caught in, uh, in, in Johannesburg. And uh, th these are people who are getting gold from the artisanal uh, uh, and small scale mining sector and uh, export it uh, illegally outside the, the formal system. So if the current system under the Kimberley Accords isn't working, what can actually be done to solve the problem? Or is it better to simply examine the entire African diamond trade as a whole? All things said and done, would it be a net benefit or loss simply removing the diamond trade from Africa altogether and moving to something like synthetic diamonds to fill the stopgap? Uh, the other day, I was on a discussion where we were talking about de-risking. Uh, that companies have been adopting a de-risking approach where they will say instead of buying the diamonds, instead of dealing with this in this country or in this uh, at this mine site, we have to uh, uh, stay back or, or just leave everything. I think uh, in in a lot of cases it will definitely affect uh, uh, communities. It will definitely affect uh, um, the the little that goes to uh, those local communities. Because there, there are good companies out there. It's not every company that is not doing the best for communities. There are companies that are trying their best to make sure that at least the community benefits and that they are paying their um, uh, taxes. And uh, those companies, I think, should closely be looked at in terms of improving their systems and making sure that at least maybe if they can increase their investments in, uh, in local communities. So if uh, the USA is we are no longer buying uh, diamonds in Sierra Leone or Liberia or any other country. It will definitely affect uh, revenue. It will affect revenue in the sense that some of the countries may be relying on, uh, on, on diamonds. But I know that in Sierra Leone, I think, or, or even Liberia, it's about 3% of the GDP in terms of uh, uh, a budget allocation. In fact, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the budgets there, 
Diamonds contribute about 3%. So the impact might be minimal, but uh, I think there definitely are supply chain actors who may feel the pinch. And those communities where diamonds are being mined, who rely on uh, on, on diamond trade and farms will definitely be affected. So I think uh, if um, there has to be any, any, any stoppage in terms of uh, of, of, of buying uh, those goods. I think uh, the best idea is to make sure that uh, we work uh, with the communities, we work with the companies and encourage those companies that are present in there or that are buying diamonds in there to adopt responsible sourcing uh, standards and responsible uh, measures when it comes to sourcing or um, across the value chain. So it's quite important to start thinking about measures that can be uh, put in place uh, in terms of ensuring that uh, the companies address the problems rather than uh, running away from the problem. Because if you run away from the problem, then no one will come and address it. So I think uh, uh, the US or even the big companies can use their leverage to make sure that uh, it, it, uh, it, it uh, excites and in some cases adopt a carrot and stick approach uh, to certain governments so that they, they, they also address uh, the, the problems in the, in the sector rather than uh, saying, leaving it to uh, those people who then in, tech, in turn take advantage of the system. Because if they say, we are no longer going to buy diamonds from you, then uh, the, the illegals, the criminals and the rebels will take advantage of the, situ the situation and continue human rights violations. They will continue laundering the, the uh, money. They will continue smuggling the money, the, the, the diamonds. So I think that in itself perpetuates uh, and uh, fuels further conflicts. It's no surprise that when countries were banned from buying diamonds from the Central African Republic, the diamond sales went up in the surrounding nations. It raises questions how South Sudan can be exporting diamonds without having a diamond mine in South Sudan. The companies know what's going on, but the Kimberley Accord allows them to point to a certificate and say, well, to the best of my knowledge, this came from an ethical and safe mine in South Africa. And without some incredibly difficult chemical testing, there is always no way to prove them wrong. So the industry will continue to shrug and say, look, we're doing the best we can. Some people will say we should go the way of ivory. Ivory sales have been somewhat curbed by creating synthetic ivory that is chemically the same, but cheaper to buy and produce. Therefore, removing the incentive to kill elephants, as there's no way to sell the ivory anyway. And the aim being that we can replace these diamonds coming from somewhat questionable countries with scientists in labs in first world nations. But on the other hand, without the diamond trade, many of these African villages may lose their one source of income. And when income disappears and power vacuums form, terrorism and extremism often step in. The only thing that we can be certain of is that the current system isn't working. Diamond companies are patting themselves on the back for not accepting diamonds from one country whilst paying good money for those diamonds as long as someone can smuggle them across the river. The industry's entire safety procedure can be undone with the invention of pants pockets. The sellers are making their money, the smugglers are making their money, the dictators are making their money, and the public feel good on the assumption that their diamonds are supposedly 100% ethically sourced, thanks to the Kimberley Accords. Thank you so much to everybody who tuned into this episode. This was one I've wanted to do for a while, and it was great to be able to chase this story down the rabbit hole. As you might have seen last week, we put out another accompanying written piece along with our podcast to talk about the war in Yemen and the UAE's future role in the peace process. This is just another from our new series of written analysis pieces going into deep dive subjects often not covered by most of the news outlets. So if you want to get even more from the red line and dive into really obscure conflicts, you can check them out on our website, www.theredlinepodcast.com. But if you want to be notified right away and read these pieces as soon as they come out, or even ask questions, the best way you can do that is through our social media. And you can find us on Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, and Discord on the handle at the Redline Pod. 
Or if you want to ask me a question personally, you can find me on Twitter on the handle at MikeElliottOz. Oz is in Australia. This show would not be possible without the support from our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each week to help us keep the show going. Our Patreons who get to join on games nights and live Q&As, and also get extra materials from the show, are absolutely amazing and are the sole reason we can keep this show going. Our Patreon's donations go all 100% back into the program, having us pay for staff, programs, hosting, websites, lawyers, and all the essentials for running a show like this. I cannot thank all of our current Patreons nearly enough, and if you feel like you can spare a few dollars a week, we would greatly appreciate it. We'll be announcing the next dates for our next Redline Geopolitics pub quiz coming up in a few weeks, so if you're a Patreon, it'll be in your inbox, otherwise follow our social media. As usual, here are our three book recommendations if you want to take your learning into this subject even further. The first is The Looting Machine by Tom Burgess. This book was my favorite book from a few years ago and is one of the best around for understanding the African mining trades and how corruption moves the wheels of Africa. Honestly, Tom's work is amazing. The second is Blood Diamonds, Tracing the Deadly Path of the World's Most Precious Stones by Greg Campbell, who is a fantastic journalist in the area. And the last book is The Faint of Africa, A History of the Continent Since Independence by Martin Berideth, for a greater look at the history surrounding these issues. I want to thank our guests this week, Brad Brooks Rubin, Russell Shaw, and Shamizo Matizi. You were all absolutely amazing, and thank you so much for coming on the program to talk about this pretty controversial subject. I also want to give a big thanks to my staff, Owen Swift, the producer, Perry Grace and Daniela Zavella, the research assistants and writers, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, and Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. Without you guys, the show would not be possible at all, so I just want to say thank you for all of your hard work. I really could not do this show without my team, and I am very lucky to have the best of the best working here at The Red Line. And my last thanks goes out to you for tuning into the show. This audience has been amazingly accepting, allowing us to chase after stories about the UAE's diplomacy one week, and then diamond trades in Africa the next, and coming along for the ride. So I really want to thank you for everyone who tunes into this program each and every time, because it's just been amazing to be able to have the flexibility to go after stories we think are really interesting and dive far into them. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode about a conflict unfolding as we speak. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.